Thank you. I'm Abdullah Fayyad, in for Adam Riley. Tonight on Talking Politics, with Election Day just a month away, we'll dig into some of the key races to watch in the campaign for Boston City Council. We'll start with District 5 and the candidates running to replace Ricardo Arroyo. But first, it's been a frustrating couple of weeks of national politics. There was yet another budget stalemate that brought us to the brink of a government shutdown. A last minute temporary agreement that only holds off the chaos for another month. And then the mind boggling leadership fight in which a handful of Republicans ousted the Republican speaker for dealing with Democrats to avert the shutdown. That's not to mention, one of the first moves the interim speaker made with his limited new authority was to kick former speaker Nancy Pelosi out of her Capitol office. This is just the latest in a decades long saga of extreme dysfunction in Washington. And if it all makes you feel like you wanna lie down and take a nap, you're not alone. A recent poll by the Pew Research Center found that nearly two thirds of the country always or often feel exhausted when thinking about politics. After they presented the survey, Pew researchers teamed up with the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate to talk about how to salvage Americans' faith in government. I'm joined now by the CEO of the Institute, Adam Hines, and Linda Dorsina Fori, a member of the Board of Directors. They're both former Massachusetts State Senator. Thank you both for joining me today. Um, Senator Hines, I wanted to start with you. If you could just zoom out and give us the big picture here, you know, how did we get to this point where Americans have so much distrust in government? Thanks, Abdullah. It, you know, it was a, I guess, a not a, not a surprising set of results, but very concerning. And I think that we've seen that uh, Americans are more and more polarized, um, and that that's one that we were kind of trying to lift up the hood and say, well, what can we do about it? We saw in the in the the data that starting you know at around 2007 and 8 is when you really start to see the the major differences and negative views of both parties where their negativity uh, negative outcomes are you know far exceeding their favorable views and so i think for us we're we're trying to figure out well why did we why is that happening i think the the research often has been good at identifying uh, some of the drivers of group behavior i think what's shifting is recognizing now how politicians use those divisions for their own political gain, and that's a real red flag. Well, so let me ask you about that kind of uh, inflection point in 2007 and 08, where you kind of saw that divergence between the parties. Um, you know, back then you had a deeply, deeply unpopular president on his way out, and you had, you know, a very popular, energetic a campaign for change that was inaugurated in, in 2009. Um, and when President Obama was elected, um, you know, given the amount of hope that was there, what happened, um, you know, in, in Obama's first term that kind of made that the inflection point and didn't reverse course? And the word hope was used in these findings. 10% of Americans are have hope in our political system right now. 4% are excited about politics. That's just uh, pretty pretty dire. Um, and I think you're right. That time frame speaks to some of the generally accepted now drivers to division amongst groups, right? Economic shocks, uh, status uncertainty, racial resentment, um, geographical sorting. And so you see each of those uh, really elevated in that time frame. Uh, Senator Forey, let me ask you, um, what, what do you think was the driver then? I mean, I, I would say that the driver was obviously hope is still here, first of all, right? Even though um, this report is in dire, right? It's very um, disturbing and, and a little bit depressing. Um, but I do think, you know, with President Obama coming in, I think it goes back to the leadership and the people that we have in these positions. Because if you remember and recall, um, there was this whole negative undertow. Right. In terms of and you don't ever really want to, you know, lift up various parties. But, um, you know, there was an undertow of, you know, this gentleman is not really American. Right. If we could take it all the way back. And I think that was still the sentiment that was happening um, within Congress. And, and, you know, in terms of the legislative piece where f folks in leadership right in the House and Senate um, on the Republican side and not to make it, you know, Republican or Democrat. But that was one of 
the focuses, right, that we will not let this gentleman get reelected. And it was really driving this um, division, continuing to drive the division within our country. Right. And I think that, you know, being part of the Institute and having um, President Hines and the amazing work, right, focusing on civics, we have to go back to the basics right. and really getting the electorate educated and really participating and engaging in our democracy. Right. I mean, well, it was Obama's successor that drove that lie that yeah. he wasn't even born in the country. Yes, right. um, so let, I want to also ask uh, you, Senator, you know, one thing that this survey showed was that there is a sharp disconnect between voter turnout and this distrust in government. So the last three elections saw some of the highest turnout um, compared to previous elections of those years. Um, what what is the cause of that disconnect? You would think that if people had such distrust in government, um, they might not turn out to vote. You know what? Great point. And in terms of the report, that was really clear um, because there is record turnout. But we know, you know, the ex experience around self-governance, it has to be focused around an educated electorate, right, that understands and has the news and basic information around what's taking place within their communities and not just locally, but obviously federally. And I think for this report, you know, one of the pieces that was really interesting is, and it didn't really touch on this, right? Though the Pew has done research before around the media and the news piece, um, which is critical. But since 2005, over 2,200 local newspapers have shuttered their doors, right, nationally. And those that have been captured by corporate organizations has been stripped to bare bones. And so you have about 20% of Americans that live in news deserts, right? So they don't even know what's happening locally in their local government with the teachers, with the firefighters. And we really have to work on going back to basics and educating the masses and I think this is the work you know that the Institute has been trying to do right not just focusing on our older adults but really the young people as well yeah Senator Hines uh, do you think you know that disconnect might be explained by you know people being driven by fear are these voters being driven by fear as opposed to you know hope and faith in the institutions that they're just kind of wanting to have their voice heard in spite of all of all of the distrust that they have in, in our institutions yeah, just on this last point about the, the disconnect in, in youth, uh, there was a part of the poll showed that if you're over 50, you're more likely to think that your vote matters and can impact um, the governing institutions. If you're under 50, they're less likely to believe that, which is um, another kind of generational concern. Yeah, I, I think the bottom line is um, leadership matters. And and so um, the, the problem is that when you see polarization as a political strategy, uh, people do look to leader, political leaders in particular as the head of their group, uh, if you will. And so they define what is acceptable behavior. They define how you engage with someone you disagree with. Uh, part of our work here at the Institute has bring, been bringing two sitting senators before a national audience to debate. We did this just two weeks ago with Marco Rubio and, and Chris Coons, and, um, and and allow them to to essentially say, look, we need to lock arms and and honor the democratic norms and institutions in this country if we're going to get through this division. And well, um, actually, and so we've, we've been focused on that. I want to stop yeah. you right there because we have a clip of that. Could we could we roll that clip of Senator Coons and Rubio talking about this? We've seen in our 13 years in the Senate together how frequently we are voting, how frequently we have regular order, how frequently we are meaningfully legislating. Our Senate floor is empty and silent most of the time. When the level of polarization paralyzes you and makes you incapable of confronting serious challenges, then you've got a big, big problem. It's not the nastiness that's the problem ultimately, it's the inability to act. So Senator Forey, you were a legislator. How, how do you address that? How do you address um, that problem of people not willing to come together? reach out across the aisle? No, I mean, oh, great question, right? And we were senators together with Senator Hines, and, you know, we did work that way. And I think, you know, as you think of being from Boston or being from Massachusetts with roots, you know, we think of leaders like the Institute's namesake, right? Ted Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, you know, and yearn for his ability um, of the, the cordial, the bipartisanship relationships that he enjoyed. And I think that that was really important in how we govern, right? It's how do you bring people 
people with different views, with different ideas to the table, and recognizing the art of compromise. But it is really about relationship building. And so, you know, that's a model that we have to work on getting back to that. But it comes to having conversations and dialogue, doesn't it? Right? And really creating a space and a place where that can happen. And I think, you know, being a trustee of the institute, and we were, last night we had the, uh, uh, you know, we had a conversation on the Pew Research and Lita Daschle, who's also a trustee, you know, was able to talk about, um, you know, the relationships that were formed on the other side, even though we're in Massachusetts. And yes, we have super majority as Democrats and yeah. you could count the Republicans on 10 hands, you know, you still create this um, camaraderie, right? Yeah. And recognizing that we need each other and really understanding that the issues that impact one person or one community impacts others as well. Well, um, we are out of time, uh, but that's a great point. Um, thank you both for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Abdallah. Thank you. Next up, for the first time in the history of the city, multiple incumbents were defeated in the preliminary elections for Boston City Council. That includes Ricardo Arroyo, who lost his fifth district seat, representing Roslindale, Hyde Park, and parts of Mattapan. Next month, Enrique Pepin will go head-to-head -head with Jose Ruiz for the job. Enrique is the former executive director of the Office of Neighborhood Services for Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Thanks for joining me today, Enrique. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, just to start off, can you give our viewers, uh, 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 tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Why are you running for this seat? Yeah, absolutely. So, I'm a son of immigrants that decided to come to Boston to start a home here. And my sense of gratitude to the city of Boston, of growing up in the Boston public housing and learning how to swim at a, at a public pool, learning how to read at the library, I said, you know what, I wanna give back. And now I'm raising my own two kids in Rosendale with my wife and I see an opportunity here to truly give back to the same families that have the same story that my parents had and make Boston a better place to live for them. Well, you do have a compelling background. My colleagues at the at the Globe editorial board, um, it, partly that's why they they chose to endorse you um, in in the preliminary race. Um, you know, but uh, I wanted to ask you about the issues uh, that we discussed. Um, you know, when you came to the Globe, um, on on on, for example, transit. Um, what are your plans for the city? Where do you think the city uh, needs to work when it comes to transportation needs? Yeah, absolutely. It's no surprise that congestion is a huge issue in the city of Boston. But more specifically in the district, when I'm door knocking, all I hear is people are concerned about street safety, about the speeding of vehicles. I want to see more implementations from the administration of bringing in speed humps, stop signs, better right, risen crosswalks so that when pedestrians are crossing the street, when as a parent our kids are playing in the sidewalks, we don't fear that they may get hit by a speeding vehicle, which has happened already, unfortunately, on Wood Ave in High Park a few months ago. So that's what I'm hearing. I want to make sure that residents feel like they can go outside and have reliable transportation, but also feel safe. Do you support, for example, um, you know, more more bus lanes and bike lanes, for example, on Center Street in West Roxbury? I do. Yeah. I do. Why? Because that that leads to a safe mode of transportation, as I just mentioned, not just for the people that are driving the vehicles, but those that have to rely on bus service. Mm -hmm. We forget that, on average. A person of, you know, a black or brown person spends more than 64 hours per year on a bus due to traffic. So by implementing these bus lanes, we are giving them back hours of their life that they can use. Yeah. How do you balance that? How do you balance people's, uh, you know, the community's voices? Um, you know, oftentimes a lot of people come out in opposition for this. The pe voices who are often heard are opposed to bike lanes. You know, how do you balance, um, you know, community participation with actually getting this done in a reasonable amount of time so it doesn't drag on for a few years every time you want to prop up some street yeah. safety program? As someone that's running for office and I, I'm listening to perspectives on all aisles of the spectrum, it's very evident I won't be able to please everyone. But as long as we're leading towards a city that is going to be inclusive and equitable, even when we're talking about transportation, I think that that's the end goal here. I want to make sure that we are not fearing for our life about losing our life on, on Washington Street, on River Street, on Blue Hole Avenue in Mattapan. But also that when you're waiting for that 34 bus on Washington Street, you know that you're going to get to school on time. You're going to get to work on time, to the clinic. Because people really... As, when I was growing up in Boston, we would take the 93 bus in Charlestown to go to downtown or to go across the city to the health center in Jamaica Plain. 
That's what that's how I lived, and I'm pretty sure that that's a story of many Bostonians. Well, let's talk a little bit about public safety. Um, you know, the city council recently approved the grants for the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, or BRIC as it's often called. That's you know where the quote unquote gang database um, is stored. Um, you know, the mayor uh, supported that measure to um, approve those grants. I believe it was somewhere around three million dollars, three point four million dollars um, in federal grants. Um, would you have supported that measure? Do you, would you have supported, uh, you know, funding those grants for, or, or, or approving those grants for a brick? You know, that's a good question, and it makes me think of why I decided to run. I want to make sure that when I'm getting into office in January as an ex-counselor, it's about being solution-minded. It's about looking at something like the brick and say, what is the issue at the moment? I want to make sure that we are pushing for more transparency and accountability from the police because unfortunately there is a lot of distrust of how those funds may be used. Yeah. But I also see that there's an opportunity here to use those funds to actually do good with it by, but by holding PPD accountable. I want to make sure that we're looking at what's possible here. And so, you know, do you think the gang database, for example, do you, do you believe that should be abolished? The incumbent right now, Councillor Arroyo, you know, he, when he ran for DA, and he's made this an issue of his campaign in the past, that he believes the gang database should be abolished, should be scrapped entirely. Is that something that you would support? You know, when I think about who live in my district and the conversation that I have, the biggest topic at the moment is public safety. As someone that grew up in public housing, during the times of a large gang, um, presence at the Charlestown Public Housing, it was evident that families wanted change. And I want to look at the brick as an opportunity. Um, now that it, it has been passed, so we're going to have those funding there. I want us to be able to use them appropriately. So to be sure, you don't want to roll back the gang database or you don't want to completely scrap it. You wouldn't advocate for that. I want to take this as an opportunity. Now that it's been approved, I want to make sure that the city is using it wisely. Okay. So increase transparency, but not necessarily exactly. um, scrap it. Exactly. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, about Mayor Wu. Um, obviously, uh, you worked in her administration. Um, how do you evaluate your former boss? I mean, you know, one of your jobs as city councilor, um, should you be elected, would be uh, to be a check on the mayor. Um, you know, where do you think she's fallen short in the last two years, and what would you like to push her on as a councilor? You know, as a city councilor, in a city like Boston, your job is to make sure that we're holding whoever the mayor is accountable. If it's Mayor Wu, previous Mayor Walsh, Mayor Menino, you name it. I want to go in there and look at her and say, listen, my district is asking for these things, such as the transportation policies that they're asking for, because at the moment they feel like she's falling short on that. I also want to make sure that we're fixing our BPS budget. There's a lot of parents in my district with young kids that feel like BPS is failing them. So I want to make sure that I'm pushing her on that, to make sure that we're bringing those resources to the city, to my district, because at, that, at this moment, families feel like more can be done. And I'm ready to hold her accountable and work with her and administration to make that possible. How do you feel about her plan for the O'Brien School? You know, as a former city, as a former senior class president of the O'Brien, it's, it's such an interesting conversation because I know how I feel as a student, that Roxbury is the heart. Of, this, of, of that school. The reason why I fell in love with that school is because it was in Roxbury. But if the mayor decides to go forward with this, you know, I want to make sure that the biggest concerns are taken care of, which well, is transportation. Yeah. Well, we are running out of time. I would have loved to ask you a lot more questions. Um, but I want to thank you for, for joining us today, and good luck on the campaign. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Enrique. Finally, tonight, Pepin's opponent for Boston City Council's 5th District seat. Jose Ruiz is a retired 29-year veteran of the Boston Police Department. He joins me now. Jose, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, listen, pleasure is mine. I'm so happy to be here. Well, why don't we start off by you telling our viewers uh, why you're running in this race? So, first and foremost, I want to let people know that I'm a son of Boston. I came into the United States with my mom and family when I was two years old. I've grown up in uh, primarily in the South End, but I lived in other neighborhoods. I feel like I've been adopted by every neighborhood. I'm comfortable wherever, wherever I've landed. Um, my mom is probably the most famous La uh, Afro-Latina in the city of Boston. She's one of the founders of Villa Victoria. So I walked in her shoes. I got to do a lot of things that she did. So I've enjoyed my ride. 
So let's talk a little bit about the issues. Uh, just this week, uh, the city council, where you hope to work, um, approved the federal grants, I think about $3 million, uh, for the Boston Regional Intelligence Center um, at the BPD, your former employer. Um, you know, BRIC, as it's known, is where the gang database um, is. Um, you know, if you were on the council this past week, would you have voted to approve those funds? So before I get to the answer, please, Let's not paint the Boston Police Department with the same brush as, as, as in the United States. And also we have to re remember that we got to diversify the BRIC. The BRIC is just not gathering intelligence of gang, gang activities, but any activities, whether it's white supremacies that we've had issues in the past, whether it's watching over our parades or, or anything like that. It's more than just gathering intelligence on gang members, but it's also keeping our, our, our neighborhood safe. I would definitely uh, have what you call it, uh, voted in support of it, but I want people to understand too that there was a shooting of five family members in Franklin Field, which would have been earmarked for more cameras there in that area. I'd rather have the cameras there and hopefully solve the crime, but we couldn't do it because no cameras weren't there. On the 4th of July on Edgewater Drive along the, the Positive River, 47 shots rang out, 47 shots. We're earmarked over there for cameras. We didn't get them there. That could have been 47 people dead. So I'm, I'm in support of public safety. So let me ask you a little bit more specifically, the incumbent um, counselor, uh, Ricardo Arroyo, has been vocal about his uh, desire to abolish uh, the gang database, um, talked about all of the flaws it's in, its discriminatory uh, nature, um, or at least the disparate outcomes from it. Um, would you want that to stay in place? Well, for the foremost, uh, there is no community, there is no neighborhood, there is no togetherness unless there's public safety. Without public safety, there's only probably chaos. So I tell people all the time, there has to be some type of component of law enforcement in order to keep things in check. If not, then we do it, we go back to being serfs and, and everybody else and doing it our own way. That's not how we're set up. We need the police. We are the police. So to be clear though, on the gang database, you want that to stay in place? Absolutely. Would you do anything to, to reform it or anything on the city, do you think the city council should do to make sure that there's no discriminatory outcomes out of the gang database? Uh, and then I would say that I have to remind people that it's already transparent. And I ask people, what more transparency do you want? More than anything else is checks and balances where civilians who are involved to actually review the information. People forget that the Boston Regional Intelligence um, Center is not just the police, it's local, state, and federal, which includes civilians there. I constantly review it for fairness, not only um, towards the citizens, but also the police who will respond to these calls. Do you think that, though, in this database, there's a disparate outcome when it comes to, for example, surveilling black and brown residents of the city versus white supremacist groups? For example, when there was a white supremacist uh, march in Boston that took, took uh, law enforcement a little bit by surprise, um, you know, that was kind of floating under the radar. Do you think there's an out a disparate outcome there that ought to be addressed with the database? It always has to be addressed. Listen, I'm Latino. I'm a third black. I'm a third European influence, and I'm also a third of indigenous uh, Indians there in Puerto Rico. I'm sorry, but my mom, again, is an Afro-Latina. My concern about black and brown people, I am related to a whole bunch. So, yes, I am there to defend everybody. Okay. Well, so let me, let's move on because we only have so much time. I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, Mayor Wu, what you think of, of her tenure uh, so far. Part of your job as city councilor will be to be a, a check on the mayor. How do you evaluate her performance over the last few years? What would you like to push her on should you be elected to the city council? I want to remind people if the mayor's doing well, the city of Boston is doing well, the state of Massachusetts is doing well. No one's going to be a bigger, better advocate of Mayor Wu than myself. Is she doing a great job? No. Is she doing a good job? Yes. Am I going to constantly push her? Yes. Absolutely. So to rate her at this point, I'd like to read it after four years. So I want to what see gets her from good to great? So I'm good to great, I would say good. I said, you know, saying someone they're excellent or, or, or beyond anything like that's unfair to them. She's good and she's, uh, she's a work in progress. Yeah. But w w what do you think that, that progress ought to be? What, 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 what do you think? I would hope that, you know, she continues her visibility. I, I would hope that she continues her inclusion of people. I've been an agent of social justice all my life. I'm going to say I've, I've done things without wanting to do the fanfare. I know that she has to do a lot of things without fanfare. If I had to push on anything, I would say get out there more. I know it's tough that she has a family. I know it's tough for her in her position, but she's got to understand she works 24-7. That's what she signed up for. And then she has me who will always be her supporter, be there. She'll call me. I'll be there.
What are your top priorities if you're elected? What, what would you like to get done in your first term? What do you think the most urgent issues facing the city of Boston are? First and foremost, you know, I think everything is a priority, but I want to talk about traffic. I grew up in the South End, which was dense. Listen, my brother on a bet once um, said, can you beat the number 43 bus from downtown to the South End? I beat it by eight minutes running. And I was all 15 years old. I tell people all the time, traffic has always been here in the city of Boston. We need to condition our folks to take alternate means of transportation. We talk a lot about the bicycle lanes. The Boston Globe a couple of weeks ago rode up with its 80 miles of um, bicycle lanes, but less than 2% of uh, city of Boston residents who identify themselves as bicycle commuters. That's not a happy medium. I look forward to towards the future because I mentor a lot of young people and I listen to them. They have my ear. I want the, to be their future, but it's also my future too. So how do you decongest the roads? Do you think there how should be more bus lanes? Do you think, is, do we have enough bike lanes? What, what do you think we should do? I, I, uh, with, uh, with less than 200 bicycle com commuters in the city of Boston, I would say you need less bikes, uh, bike lanes. And I think you need to talk to folks, too. I mean, in the South End, where I grew up, it went from four lanes to two lanes, and they added more bicycle lanes. If you speak to the people of color, black and brown, they're opposed to it. If you speak to the incoming people who have been there less than five years, they say it's more. There's not a happy medium there. In West Roxbury, the neighbors, the residents who walk those streets are opposed to new bicycle lanes. So now we're going to have people who are the outside who don't live there who are influencing bicycle lanes. That's not fair to the residents. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's a hot topic that there are residents on both sides of this always, mm -hmm. um, you know, it does become a heated debate. But how, how do you get people out of cars then if, if you don't make room for alternate modes of transportation? If not bikes, do you think bus lanes? Do you think we should have more bus lanes? Uh, again, things have to make sense. I know the big issue over in Mattapan is the, uh, the creation of um, bike lanes over on the Blue Hill Avenue. I want to let you know that if you speak to a a ton of people were in Mattapan or that in the Dorchester. They are horrified on the discussions of bike lanes down Blue Hill Avenue. We also know that Mattapan Square, like Roslindale and West Roxbury and those areas are the gateways and also the exits out of the city of Boston. Well, narrow roads. Welcome to my uh, small city with narrow roads. We're going to make them more narrow. That doesn't make sense. All right. Well, Jose, we're going to have to end it there because we are out of time. But thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate you. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week and tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. For now, thanks for watching and good night.